that New Zealand was uninhabited until 800 years ago. The oral tradition, however, of the Maori tribes, the indigenous Polynesians that live in New Zealand, tell of legendary blonde fairy people living in hobbit-like burrows and red-haired giants that also roamed these islands in ancient times. So who were these blonde and red-headed populations that are described in these myths and what happened to them? The well-known Kiwi legend speaks of a time when the first canoes arrived only to find that there was already a race of blonde-haired fairies that lived in the forest and they were called the Patu Payare. Now the Maori respected these little people who were very elusive, rarely seen, uh, but they can hear them giggling and chuckling at night and rowing their small wakas, which are basically like canoes, and their skin color was described as light or pale, their hair was light, and they were sometimes seen on the slopes of the misty mountains, and they would come down to, uh, to the sea to fish, and this would usually take place in the evening at night when it was dark or very misty, and as the legend says, one early morning, one of them were, one of the Maori were said to have witnessed blonde people fishing, and I presume they were startled and they took off, but they left behind one of their nets, which from then on was used by the Maori themselves, who attribute this method of fishing technology to these little fairies. They also learned from them how to make a type of musical instrument, a flute that they carved, and they were considered to be, you know, sort of magical people, and upon occasion they would play their flute and lure away, uh, enchant a woman, and she would never be seen from again. There's another legendary race of fair-skinned people from New Zealand with golden hair, and they were agriculturalists, they carved out amphitheaters, and these people were said to be tall, had very white skin, and were likely the origin of the famous tattoos that you see. Fully facial tattoo, which was only for the ones of high rank. People think everyone got tattoos in the old days, they're wrong. Five to ten percent at the most, you had to be something to deserve it, especially a facial tattoo. And the people that were basically here before we got here, okay? Well known to be, you know, tall, fair skinned, um, definitely not little fairies. They are still around. They are all still blonde. Were these people real or not? They were. We've got a family, you know, who descend from them. There are modern blonde populations in New Zealand called the Waka Blondes. And they're Maori, but they have a distinct, different lineage than the Polynesian people. We've got uh, people in New Zealand who uh, were once described as the waka blondes. A lot of them actually have very traceable whakapapa that's much, much older than any of the uh, Polynesian Maori whakapapa, and they know where they came from. Uh, I know one uh, individual, uh, an old kuia, a very dignified lady, who uh, claims to come out of Persia, and the area that she's talking about, very close to India, and... Um, when we did DNA analysis on this lady, uh, it shows a high incidence of her blood group or her DNA in the Persian area, so she's quite correct. But then the second big uh, block, if you like, of people that share her DNA are found in Peru. This is very interesting, as it concurs almost exactly with a Maori legend recorded over a hundred years ago by ethnologist Elsden Best when he was living amongst the Tuhoi people. The legend tells us that their ancestors in times long passed away, 165 generations or around three and a half thousand years ago, migrated from a hot country named India. The cause of this exodus 
was a disastrous war with the dark-skinned folk in which great numbers were slain. This war was recorded in the Indian epic known as the Mahabharat. The legend continues on to describe their voyages which eventually took them into Polynesia. They crossed the oceans to Tafiti Roa, a long skinny land believed to be Central America, and then on to Tafiti Nui, a very large land, South America. And from there, they ventured into the scattered isles of the Pacific. This Two Hoy story describes a very different history to the one that asserts that the Polynesians came from Taiwan, and it could even turn Pacific prehistory on its head. We came from the this ancient place outside of Egypt named ancient Persia. Today it is named Iran or Iran, whichever way you want to say it. But when I told my family, oh, they were proud when I told them that they came from ancient Persia. Some of them said, oh, are we Arabs? I said, well, actually, we'd be described as being Egyptian yeah. more than Arabs. Oh, here yeah. they are. <laughs> We couldn't believe our eyes when we first saw Monica's family. Right in front of us was a living representation of the green-eyed, golden-haired people we've been looking for. They're not just fairy folk of the forest, all mythical beings. They are real. This ancient Iranian or Aryan bloodline, incidentally, is the same that we find in the oldest mummies found in China which, like most of the mummies in ancient Egypt, are blonde and red-headed and have Caucasoid features. The mummies from China don't look like they should be in China. They look like they should be in Denmark or Ireland or northern Germany because they look like people from over there. DNA steps up to the plate and they can tell us where they came from. Well before the opening of the Silk Road, which is dated to 138 BC, these mummies date back, some of them, 2000 BC. The uh, female mummies were mostly of local origin. However, there's another type of testing, the Y chromosome testing, which is the male line. The males came from parts further west, not necessarily Ireland, but places like Iran, maybe towards uh, parts of Turkey. The mom's side and the grandmother's side is from the Tarim Basin, and the father's and the grandfather's side were moving in with their sheep, with their herds, slowly but surely, and having families. Geneticists have compared mitochondrial DNA from blue-eyed individuals in countries as diverse as Jordan, Denmark, and Turkey, concluding that people with blue eyes have a single common ancestor that lived by the Black Sea around 8,000 years ago and spread out with agriculture. Professor Eiberg from the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Copenhagen said, and I quote, the first blue-eyed humans were among the Proto-Indo-Europeans who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. It's called Filefot in England, Hawken Cruz in Germany, Tetra Gamadion in Greece, Wan in China, Manji in Japan, and Swastika in India. In his 1896 book, The Swastika, the earliest known symbol and its migrations, Thomas Wilson, former curator of the Department of Prehistoric Anthropology in the U.S. National Museum, wrote of the swastika, and I quote, an Aryan symbol used by the Aryan peoples before their dispersion throughout Asia and Europe. This might even serve as an explanation how, as a sacred symbol, the swastika might have been carried to different peoples in which we now find it by the splitting up of Aryan peoples and their migrations and establishment in various parts of Europe. There are populations in modern Iran, such as the Kurds, 
specifically the Yazidi, who unlike their Arab and Islamic oppressors, are Indo-European people, and Adnan Kokar, chairman of the Kurdish Cultural Center in London, said that, and I quote, the Kurds and Yazidis are originally Aryans, but because the Yazidis are such a closed community, they have retained their fair complexion, blonde hair, and blue eyes. ISIS has taken around 300 women from Zinjar to give to jihadists to marry and make pregnant. If they can't kill all Yazidis, they will try to smash their blonde bloodline. Here is a video where mercenary militants explain their agenda, which includes ethnic genocide and interracial sex slavery, specifically mentioning genetic features targeted, such as blue eyes. Many people are unaware that in the 1930s, the German government under Hitler sent archaeological expeditions to Asia in search of ancestral links between blonde Germans and ancient Buddhist and other proto-Indo-Europeans which the Nazis believed were connected to them linguistically, culturally, and indeed genetically. Today, academia and the media laugh at this, but academia and the media are still controlled by the same winners of World War II. The Buddhas of Bamiyan are massive monumental statues erected millennia ago along the Silk Road in the Bamiyan Valley which runs through the Hindu Kush mountain region in Afghanistan. These caves were inhabited by monks which not only left mummies but also ancient depictions of themselves. Now when the Muslims came along many of the caves were destroyed. In fact the caves were used as residences and the tar from the fire covered many of the paintings inside and that sort of saved those paintings. They've been able to remove the tar deposits from the fires of the last few centuries and they have found Buddhist paintings, some of them of great beauty and color, inside the caves. A tremendous Buddhist religious complex. The large Buddha is 175 feet high, probably the biggest in all of the world. And here's what remains of it. The face was cut away many centuries ago when the Muslims took over this area. But there are Hudlin David at the bottom there to give you an idea of size. And you're looking up 175 feet. And above its head, above the head of this statue, we could see very unusual paintings. And we were told it might be possible to go up there and see the paintings at close range. I see the red beard and uh, red hair. It's a shame that these figures have all been defaced by people of other faiths at some time in the past. But it's uh, still, it's very easy to see what they looked like and we can tell who they were. He's got the red beard, uh, red hair parted in the middle. The statues that you've seen, the caves themselves, are 1,500 or more years old. And one last look at that magnificent big Buddha, 175 feet high, carved in these cliffs 1,500 years ago.
Nestled in the mountains between France and Spain, there is a semi-isolated population of native European people that have long puzzled anthropologists, linguists, and historians because although they are Caucasoid, they do not fit in with the rest of the European population. Their language, for example, is distinctly unique in Europe and not related to any other Indo-European language. But that's not the only thing that's unique about the Basque. The Basque turned out to also be unique in terms of blood. Prior to the advent of genetic research tools, investigators used the ABO blood groups to study the relationships between human populations as well as their migration patterns. Each person's blood is one of four major types, A, B, AB, or O. Blood types are determined by the types of antigens on the blood cells. Antigens are proteins on the surface of blood cells that can cause a response from the immune system. The Rh factor is a type of protein on the surface of red blood cells. Most people are Rh positive. Those who do not have the Rh factor are Rh negative, which compromises about 15% of the world's population, but appears in much higher percentage among the Basque, which as a population contain among the highest levels of Rh negative blood in the world. The Basque people currently inhabit the area surrounding the Pyrenees Mountains, where Cro-Magnon Man left behind some of his and her most famous artwork over 30,000 years ago. But exactly who are the Basque and where did they come from? I decided that a great place to find out is the University of Nevada since it houses the Center for Basque Studies. This organization is primarily a research center that conducts and publishes on Basque related topics such as anthropology, history, cultural studies, etc. Here is what they had to say about the Basque people and their origins and this comes from their websites frequently asked questions. Question. Where did the Basque come from? No one knows exactly where the Basque come from. Some say they have lived in the area since Cro-Magnon man first roamed Europe. Some say they are descended from the original Iberians. More fanciful theories exist as well. One is that the Basques are the descendants of the survivors of Atlantis. Question. Where did the Basque language come from? Just as no one is sure about the origins of the Basque themselves, linguists are not in agreement over the origins of Uskara, the Basque language, either. When asked, I found that the majority of the Basque people themselves maintain that they came from Atlantica, a powerful maritime nation that sank into the Atlantic Ocean after a terrible cataclysm and from which a few survivors reached the Bay of Biscay and the Pyrenees Mountains. This, they say, is not just mythology, but their true pre-European ancestry. There's another ancient people who claim racial lineage from the mythical Atlanteans. The Berbers are currently located geographically around Mount Atlas, but inhabit much of North Africa long before the Arabs arrived. The Berbers are considered the aboriginals of the area, and their origins beyond that are not officially known. Here we have a population, many of whom have blue eyes and light hair, living in Northwest Africa of all places, and among some of the blonde tribes still living near the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, the percentage of RH negative blood can reach 40%. Now keep in mind, that's not the general uh, national average, but restricted to certain local tribes. Anthropologists, for the most part, dismissed them for many years because they didn't fit well with the out-of-Africa paradigm. So it was presumed that they had migrated from somewhere in Europe. However, that theory has been abandoned with the current understanding of genetics. Scientists now accept the genetic evidence 
That concludes Berbers are an indigenous, indigenous people, which they believe are descended from native Upper Paleolithic Cro-Magnon types going straight back into the Pleistocene or Ice Age. This should make it easier to understand why the oldest remains found in Egypt, nicknamed Ginger, and currently on display in the British Museum, has naturally red hair. This is pre-dynastic, which means before the pharaohs and before the accepted dating of the pyramids. I can go on for quite some time about blonde and red-headed mummies and blue-eyed statues, but I'll save that for a future video on ancient Egypt. For now, let us turn to another population native to an island off of the African coast who also left mummies and pyramids. The Guanches were very tall, powerfully built, blonde and red-haired indigenous natives of the Canary Islands, specifically the island of Tenerife. To date, there is still no evidence that the Guanches had any knowledge of maritime technology, which begs the question, how did they get there? This isolation allowed the Guanche to maintain a racial exclusivity until the time of the Spanish conquest. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, concerning the ethnic origins and racial identity of the Canary Island Guanches, and I quote, the Guanches are thought to have been of Cro-Magnon origin with blue or gray eyes and blondish hair. Madame Blavatsky, foundress of the Theosophical Society, points out that the genetic relations between these three populations, well over a hundred years before our modern understanding of DNA, uh, and I quote, she says, if then the Basque and Cro-Magnon cavemen are of the same race as the Canaries Guanches, it follows that the former are also allied to the Aborigines of America. The Atlantean affinities of the three types becomes patent. Dabka is a folk dance native to the Eastern Mediterranean. It combines circle dance and line dancing and is widely performed at weddings and other joyous occasions. The line forms from the right to the left where the leader heads the line alternating between facing the audience and the other dancers. The Palestinian Dabka jumps may have origins in ancient Canaanite fertility rites where the Phoenicians were probably the first teachers of the dance in the world. Generally, ancient dances were connected with religious rituals, a connection that was common up until the 16th century and still continues in some countries. was a seafaring civilization that included the coastal areas of today's Lebanon, northern Israel, and southern Syria. The Phoenician writing system became widely used, spread by Phoenician merchants across the Mediterranean world, where its alphabet evolved and was assimilated by many other cultures. The Old Hebrew Alphabet, also called the Paleo-Hebrew, was adopted by the Greeks around the 12th century BC. While Hebrew was written from right to left, Greek was written from left to right. For this reason, the letters were reversed in the Greek alphabet. Here we see the first five letters of the old Hebrew alphabet. The Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, and He. But when reversed, we see the ancient Greek alphabet. The Alpha, 
Theta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon. Note that the original Hebrew names of these letters were retained for the Greek alphabet. The Aleph becomes the Alpha, the Bet becomes the Beta, the Gimel becomes the Gamma, the Dalet becomes the Delta, and the only exception is the He becomes in Greek E Salon, which means plain E. Over the centuries, these ancient Greek letters evolved into their modern Greek forms. Our English alphabet is Roman, and because the Romans adopted the Greek alphabet, we are able to see our own modern English alphabet in these ancient Hebrew turned Greek letters. The A, B, C, D, and E. As previously mentioned, the old Hebrew alphabet was used by all Semitic peoples, including the Arameans, also called the Chaldeans, but evolved independently from the Hebrew. By the 5th century BC, the time of the Israelites' captivity in Aramea, also called Babylon, it no longer resembled the old Hebrew it came from. And it is this Aramaic square script that Israel adopted during their captivity. With the Aramaic square alphabet in use by the Israelites, it continued to evolve into the modern Hebrew letters that we're familiar with today. tradition, Hebrew is a Northwest Semitic language native to an ancient people living in what is now Palestine and Israel, descended from the patriarch Jacob, grandson of Abraham, who is descended from Shem, son of Noah. So both the Greeks and the Medes come from the Indo-European family. The Indo-Europeans stretch from the Indus River in northern India to the Black Sea, and eventually all the way to Ireland. They represent one of the three Caucasian groups. Traditionally, it was taught that there were three Caucasian groups, the first being the Hamite Caucasians, who became known as the Egyptians, the second being the Semite Caucasians, who became known as the Babylonians, Hebrews, Elamites, and Assyrians, and the third being the great Indo-Europeans, or Japhites, also known as the Aryans, which included Northern Indians, Greeks, Medes, Latins, Celts, Germanic races, Slavs and Russians, also known as Scythians. This was taught in schools, universities, and even in church. It's really in the last 150 years that we've seen a major change in the biblical story at the hands of globalization. So the story goes like this. There was a flood in Mesopotamia that wiped out the first great empire known as Sumer. Why did God wipe out Sumer? The common church view is that fallen angels rebelled against God and started having children with earthly women. Now, the second more logical and realistic view that used to be taught in church was Adam's children, the sons of God, began mixing with the primitive tribal people, daughters of man. And after mixing, the offspring from this mixture became incredibly corrupt, adopting foreign violent cultures instead of what was originally taught to Adam by God. Noah was only saved because he was culturally, spiritually, and racially pure. In Genesis 6-9, it explains that God spared Noah because he was a just man, genetically perfect, and that he walked with God. We then have Noah's Ark landing on the Caucasian mountains about 4,500 years ago on Mount Ararat, which coincidentally is the home of the white race. Noah's three sons and their sons 
dispersed in different directions from this point. So the old church tradition was that Noah and his sons were the white races. So Noah's sons and grandsons divided and eventually mixed with other people. And so Noah's sons represent the three Caucasian groups. Now, today, the churches teach the whole world was submerged under water and that only eight people survived. Therefore, we are all the product of serious incest. And somehow Noah and his wife gave birth to one pure African son, one pure white son, and one pure Asian son. And we're all somehow related. However, all DNA, all archaeology, linguistics, and even our modern world testifies that exactly where Noah's Ark landed is the exact starting point for the white race. But of course, this view is racist and the modern day church view is more multicultural and therefore it's accepted. The Great Events from Great Historians, a collection from 1905, makes no apologies that Noah and his sons represent the three Caucasian groups. So this was a normal view in white Western Christian nations. Noah and his sons were Caucasian, hence why we call the mountains where Noah landed the Caucasian Mountains. The first three major empires after the flood were the Hittites in Anatolia, Egypt or Mizra, who comes from Ham's son Mizraim, and the Semites from Shem, who ruled Mesopotamia after a Semite named Sargon of Akkad conquered Mesopotamia not long after the Bible says the flood happened. These kingdoms are recorded in secular history, and the Bible fully backs this up. So the Aryans or Indo-Europeans represent the Japhites, and in Greek mythology, two of the main gods who gave birth to all the gods were Gaia and Uranus, and they gave birth to a god named Iapetus, or Japetus, who was also known as Japheth. He is one of the fathers of the Greeks. The Bible calls the Greeks Javan, who was a son of Japheth. If you go to your Bible concordance, you will see that under Javan, it says Ionian Greek. When we look at language from India to Ireland, we see connections just through the words. In Sanskrit, which is Old Indo-Aryan and is the base for the Indian language today, we see similarities when we compare it with Old Persian, Latin, Greek, and even Gaelic. We see some serious connections. From Sanskrit to Old Persian, it's almost identical. Look at the words father, mother, and brother. Even when we compare it to German and English, even when we look at Gaelic, Greek, and Latin, we can see the Aryan roots. So even after thousands of years, we can still see similarities in the languages. Now the first name of the Aryan's country was called Arata. It was in the mountains somewhere near Iran and Armenia, like the mountain Ararat, Arata, where the Bible says Noah's Ark landed and became the name Arya, Aryan, which in Sanskrit, Arya means noble or noble ones. Also, monotheism was apparently common among Aryans who eventually invented Zoroastrianism. Now, Noah wasn't Jewish or Israeli or a Hebrew or a Semite. He was the father of all of them. The Bible tells us that the Phoenicians and the Israelites had trade posts with Javan, or the Ionian Greeks, and even Tarshish, which is in Spain. We know that they established the great city of Carthage, who conquered Spain, which Spain's original name was Iberia, which meant Hebrew. So it was originally called the Hebrew Peninsula. The Phoenicians had trade posts as far as Britain, Denmark, and potentially even the New World. The island in the middle of the Mediterranean bears the Hebrew words Sar Dania, which means rulers of Dan in Hebrew. The tribe of Dan were Viking-like people who had a habit of conquering lands and then renaming it after the father of their tribe, Dan. In Russia, along the Black Sea, they recently found the burial remains of a female Sarmatian warrior. She wore a necklace with either ancient Hebrew or ancient Phoenician written on it. This was found while they were constructing an airport. Elisha was the son of Javan, the fourth son of Noah's son, Japheth, according to the book of Genesis. The Jewish historian Josephus related the descendants of Elisha with the Elonians, 
one of the ancestral branches of the Greeks, or the ancestor of the Almanim. Alemannic German from the territory of Alemannia, which includes the Swabia region of Germany, is also called High German, another form being Yiddish, the historical language of the Ashkenazi Jews, a High German-based vernacular fused with elements taken from Hebrew and Aramaic. Live on Channel 5, this is the 10 o'clock news with Deborah Norville. Coming out revealing secret negotiation between the Nazis and the Zionists in 1933, which allowed German Jews and their assets to go to Palestine. Rich Samuels joins us tonight with the story of the controversy behind the book and the author's struggle to write it. Rich? Deborah, with the rise of Adolf Hitler to power in the spring of 1933, the Jews of the world were faced with a dilemma. They could raise a cry of protest, a cry few would heed, or they could make a deal with Hitler, a deal that would bring a step closer their dream of an independent Jewish state. American Jews marched calling for the boycott of all German exports. Jews throughout Europe echoed that call. So did Jews everywhere. But a group of Zionists at the same time was quietly negotiating an agreement with the Nazis to allow the immigration of German Jews and the transfer of their assets to Palestine. That deal, reported in August 1933, was the transfer agreement. Palestine, sparsely settled by Jews at the time, was radically changed as a result. I lived in Palestine from 1933 to 1936, and uh, we saw every week transports of German Jews coming to settle in Palestine. German Jewish settlement of Palestine was, for a time, official Nazi policy. These photos of Jewish life in Palestine, along with a lengthy text, appeared in 1934 in the Berlin paper Der Angry. A Nazi visits Palestine was the title of the multi-part series. A medal was struck by Goebbels in commemoration. On one side, the swastika. On the other, the Star of David. Hitler demanded one concession for the transfer agreement, that the call for a boycott of the Reich, raised by Jews here and elsewhere, be rejected by the Zionists. The Zionists made that concession. And so, while Nazis were marching in Germany, and while Jews were marching here, diplomacy was running a more important story. In the Mediterranean, where the dream of a nation-state for Jewish people came a step closer to reality. The story in this book some will find hard to accept. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an